from Sunset Beach, Hawaii, weighing 267 pounds, the Magnificent Morocco. Why is it they call him Magnificent? The man who lifts condominiums off his chest. Anything that's explosive, anything that's exciting, Prince of Darkness, Master of Destruction, perpetrator of violence. Get ready! I'm going to burn this place down! Hello and welcome to the sixth episode of Don Morocco's Magnificent Podcast. My name is James, and if you're wondering why I'm wearing this vomit-inducing shirt of the colours that will, you know, make you, make everyone go blind, uh, it's a festive episode where we're going to be asking Don just a, an hour's worth of your personal questions that you sent through to me from Twitter or you sent through uh, on the community board on YouTube. Uh, so my name's James, if I didn't say that, uh, and I can't really see anything of these glasses, so I'm going to take them off. But uh, you can join us on Twitter, Don Morocco Pod, YouTube, Don Morocco's Magnificent Podcast, and DonTheRockMorocco.com, where you can get signed photos, signed figures, signed cards, and all other stuff uh, signed by the man himself and sent straight to you. But introducing now, once again, the man himself, the magnificent one, the beach bum, Don. How are you doing? Good day, mate. How are you doing? Good day, mate. Really good. Oh, dearie me, this crack rib of mine. Um, right, so uh, originally we were going to do the Dynamite Kid uh, episode, and then I forgot. So I, And then I just uh, as I just went, oh, let's do a, a Ask Don Anything, or AMA Ask Morocco Anything. And uh, we're going to do that then. So are you ready for an hour or slightly less than an hour's worth of material thrown yeah. at you? Okay, yeah. then. Uh, right, I really blathered on with the intro there, but I'm keeping it. Uh, so, glasses are going on. And the first question is from Doug McMillan, uh, Nova Scotia, Canada. Uh, when you fought King Kong Mosca, you cut a promo where you ripped an American dollar in half and said that that was equal to a Canadian dollar. You then said a Canadian football player was half of an American player. Did that get you heat with any of Mosca's football friends up in Canada and any other stories of fighting north of the border would also be great? That I don't know. We never spent much time in Toronto or Canada as... As it was, I, uh, Angela and I were great friends. We were together in, uh, in Texas. We started, uh, well, I met him first in Vancouver, British Columbia. When I, he was first starting out coming over from football and he was, uh, he was a heel. He was a heel there. He's coming from the Toronto territory where he was uh, with the Hamilton Tiger Cats. I guess he was picked like the, the best football player for a hundred years or the, uh, out of a century for Canadian football. And stuff like he was, he's right up there at the top of, of Canadian football players all time. So I get what happened when, and he came to Vancouver because there was a, he was a natural heel. They had a running back. I don't remember his name, an older player uh, from the United States. And he played for the British Columbia Lions. I think they are. And he was out of, and, and Angelo hit him with a late hit him. Allegedly late hit, according to Angelo. It wasn't a late hit, but it, it uh, sidelined the kid's career. And he came up and uh, it, it ruined the season for British Columbia. So he was a natural made heel for uh, for Vancouver when he came into Vancouver. So that's when I first met him. And then on and on into, uh, into, into Texas. And then later he had a sister living in Aptos, which is Santa Cruz, California. And uh, right by where I lived in he was the heel with Lonnie Main. I was still a baby face there, but um, you know, and we, we spent time. Uh, the, the, and then we got together. My first run through uh, WWF was he was in there. And he was he was the heel after me, uh, facing Bob, the champion. So yeah, but the, I wrestled him. He he'd gone. He'd finished his run in New York by that time, and he was up there, and he was the Canadian champion or whatever the. Whatever the belt was, Can Am. I can't find it here. Maple Leaf Gardens. We'll just say Canadian champion. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was the national champion of Canada. So I was, I was booked. I was still hot, you know, on, on the, on the on the New York TV, and our TV was was still carrying Toronto. There, we were still running Toronto, and he uh, had been out of New York for a while. But was wrestling, uh, was booking himself, wrestling across Canada and different places. So it was a title match with he and I, and he was the baby face. 
it was fun, you know, it was working with Ange. He was a big, uh, big agile man. Is it always like talk about Wahoo? Sorry, sorry. Uh, I was just going to say, is it always a compliment when like two bad guys get together and you're the one who's still being booed? Do you take that as a compliment? It's like, yes, I'm the better bad guy. Oh, I, I well, I don't know. He's been pushing, being pushed as a Canadian. I was, I was following, uh, I was pretty much following our own storyline. I, uh, when I got the King of the Ring from the Sheik, I was, uh, I knew nobody was going to outheal the Sheik because he was a Sheik, you know, USA, Ayatollah, two years, you know, Iran number one. So, you know, and it was because it was, it was a, it was a long night because it was a tournament and I probably, I don't remember who I wrestled in, in the course of the event, but, you know, three or four times during, during the, during the evening, I wrestled different top guys, Pedro and other, you know, other, other wrestlers in, in going through this tournament. And found out that Sheik and I were going to go. Oh God, me and Sheik. So you know, it's foolish to go out and try to out, out heal one another. It just doesn't make sense. And I had Fuji as a manager, and, and um, the Sheik just hated. I don't think he had a. I don't know if he had a manager or anything at the time, but you know, the Sheik was just a Sheik. It was just you weren't wrestling necessarily a wrestler or a talent. You're wrestling against an ideal. You know, the Russian bear or whatever it is. You know, you're wrestling against that. So it's hey. Easy, easy enough. Uh, load up your boot. You know, make me a blade. Boom, I'll go in. We'll go a little bit of back and forth. It, you know, it's been a long night. Every once, the people want to get out of here. We want to get out of here. Everybody wants out. We'll go in, start off. Boom, zig me. I'm, you know, be bleeding. Beat the hell out of me. Get ready to do something. And Fuji will hit me with the salt. You know, huh? how much, you know, huh? how much easier is it a way to lose a match than that? You know, and not, you know, not give up. Any of your any of your heat or anything you else, you know, you, I'm bleeding. Fuji misses, you know, Fuji salts you. Everything else, you know. That, so it's a, you know, it's easy to walk away. And I walk away. Baby face is the king of the ring. So you know, it's, people are happy. We're happy. Everybody's happy. We didn't have to kill ourselves in the ring, trying to prove who's you know more heat, bigger heel, worse heel. So you know, it's, stuff works out like that. You know, it just it's you, you try and there are times when you got to heal against heel. But you, you always see the, the guys, he's starting to turn. He's getting ready to, uh, you know, he's on the verge uh, of, of getting ready to, to swing. People have people got something about him that they like. And then, they, you know, they're buying into him. Right, next question from uh, just identifying himself as CL. What made Vince Senior different than his peers, or was he like the rest of the owners of wrestling territories? Well, Vince, you know, both Vince's are the class act. Vince Senior is a class act. He had the, uh, you know, he had, it was run, you know, you, you, you had other territories, other, other TVs had to run, you know, in, in a different patterns and present their stories and build their stories in different ways where, where New York was, was pretty much set for years and years. You know, you did your, your time on the TV and you started with the champion. You went through twice, and you, you know you all, all the all the TV hours and everything else. So Vince was Vince was a gentleman. Vince was, uh, you know, he, well he wasn't hands on with it. You know he had he had bookers and, and guys at you know, Strongbow and all those guys that took care of the locker room and took care of the promos and took care of everything else for him. He was just a most you know just to, to sign the check promoter. So and he was a fair guy and, and a classy guy. You know, so everybody was, uh, he wasn't involved in, you know, a lot of the, as it went on with Vince Sr., when Vince Jr. took, when the Kevin Nash and their group came in, and Flair, and this, this came all, it was, it was probably always prevalent, but didn't take a big hold into wrestling till after I was gone, when these guys had their own uh, monopoly on the offices and stuff. Mm. But there always been guys running to the office. That's uh, since Adam and me. Right, next one then. Uh, Mark Keegan asks, Don, as a Hawaiian, what was your first impression of the Midwest winters when you got to the AWA? Hated them. Hated, hated, hated living. Hated, yeah. I just got Bern Gagne took me in. I said, I, Bern, I hate this. He says, what do you want? Here's the book. Where, you know, I'll give you what the main event in Milwaukee, you know, just, just don't, you know, 
I'll put, I'll put you and Stevens here in Milwaukee. Main event. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's stuff, money. It's not, I just, you know, I, I, hate, I hate living here. You know, it's, it's, you know, when you, first of all, you, <laughs> either way I look, I'm 2,000 miles from an ocean. You know, it's just, you know, it's just not happening. Then the weather, then the snow, then everything else, and the traveling. It was, you know, it was lucky I was making money because I, you know, I probably hung myself from one of those big trees over there. <laughs> oh, we were just talking about Buffalo. Oh, it was. A, it seems like a week ago we were talking about it, where you said, uh, you know, a car was buried in snow for about three months before it was revealed. No. It was just not your kind of thing. No, I learned to live with it when I went to uh, WWF, and after, and, but that wasn't a constant, you know, living in Minneapolis, traveling out of there. There's a different, you know, a different type of people grow up in that. Uh, the Kurt, the Hennings and stuff like you know, we grew up in the in the that said snow climb, Robbinsdale, the snowmobiling, the ice fishing, and you know all that kind of stuff. So you're not like an actual. I was skier. lucky. I was I was very lucky. My my career, and, and I had a lot of good highs for success in outside territories and uh, you know big arenas and, and stuff like that. But I, for myself, I always had a counterbalance. I could I, I could surf. And I had, I, had, I had the ocean, I had the surf that, that helped uh, remove me. All right, our next question is from GOK. Did Don ever meet or wrestle Dan Crawford and or Frank Stewart, a.k.a. Dutch Savage? If so, his thoughts and any stories to share? Dan Crawford, I was in uh, Japan with him. He was with um, uh, Doug Furness, right? Yeah. Were they tagged? Yeah. Canada? Yeah. yeah. I met him. I met him in Japan. Good worker, too, you know. Too, I, didn't, I don't think I wrestled him. Um, that's when I was. I was a mask guy. I was a Akioni in Japan. And um, who was the other guy? Uh, Dutch Savage. Oh yeah, Dutch. Dutch. Uh, Dutch was working around um, around Portland when I first started. He was a. Uh, he was a top guy around there. And then I guess he took over after a while. He'd been to Hawaii. I wasn't working at the time, but he, he came in and he spent some time in Hawaii because Hawaii and Portland were like sister territories. And I think coming back from Japan, he spent some time there. Probably as a, you know, like a office uh, liaison for Don Owens who gave, uh, loaned Ed Francis the money to buy the Hawaii territory from Al Karasik. So, but I knew I knew uh, Dutch up in up in Portland, but I never spent a long time in, in as a territory in Portland. You know, as, as a really months up on my. I went there for shoulder rehab for two or three weeks one time, and then I went up there. Um, went through there a couple other times. You know, com, coming down from Vancouver, but I never spent. Dutch was there, and when I was there, he didn't have a bed. Then later on, he got had a bad reputation for his office and stuff like that. But you know, I never had any any anything to do with that. Uh, just to clarify, what was the reputation? Because I, I I have no idea about that. He did screw guys, take them around. Uh, when I was there, when the my shoulder, uh, Jimmy Snooker was in, and he was uh, he was their star, and Dutch was uh, still the top top heel for there, and. Uh, they, they seemed to get along famously, you know. So, you know, and, and Dutch was cool then. So it was after, you know, I, and he was uh, he was another contributor to Pappy Owen's Cigar. You know, he was, uh, the, he did, he used to do tricks with it. But, um, yeah, aside from that, you know, I never, I never knew him to be, you know, a rat. But, you know, he, later on he got a reputation. I I heard some. When he was wrestling, he and Snooker were, he and Snooker were rivals. And I was just, I was still babyface up there on, a, on a rehab for a couple of weeks from a total clavicle. So um, it, it seemed all good there. And then, but then later on, I heard you know derogatory things about him. Hmm. Great worker, hell of a worker. Good, good look, face, look, you know, good heel. Good six three ish. Good move real well. Yeah. You're uh you were always billed as six three. Were you actually six three? Once upon a time, yeah. 
before I started shrinking. Uh, about five four now. Uh, <laughs> we'll move on to the next I was one. About six, oh. I was close to pretty damn close to six three, six two and a half, six yeah, six three different different uh, measurements. Taller than Vince McMahon, at least. So that's the important. You are always got to be taller than the guy who's interviewing you, which is the main thing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We'll go on to the next one then. And uh, Jonathan Turbide, Quebec City, Canada. Don, I always enjoy watching your interactions with Killer Cal Rudman, who worked as a backstage interviewer on several shows taking place at the Philadelphia Spectrum. You two had a very special chemistry. These promos you did together are incredibly entertaining. Are you still keeping in touch with Cal and were you close friends in real life? Thank you, Don, and thank you, James. Um, no, I, we weren't close friends, but I was, uh, you know, I'd get in there and if I had an interview or something, they, they had a, they had, the Spectrum had their own channel running through, uh, South Jersey and, and, uh, and Philadelphia there. It was like, much like in the Madison Square Garden had their own channel coming out of, out of the arena. Uh, so, and he worked for, uh, um, D Spectrum. I don't know if it's Spectrum TV, but he worked for Spectrum and I would pump him up, you know, Cal, and I put him over on the interviews and stuff. So he liked, uh, he, he had a good time. You know, we had a good, had a good time doing promos together. Uh, I guess I called him Killer Cal and made him out, you know, and I made him parts. You know, I, I don't remember now. I've seen a couple interviews in the past, but you know, I always made him part of. You know, the guy was the guy. Like I said, like I like I said, I missed my opportunity with Oprah. I mean, if they were willing to get into it, you know, I would. I would work with him, you know, and I, I, I put him over and make him, you know, killer cow, you know, or something, you know, and he loved that, you know, so it was easy. And he, he you know, he, in turn, he, he gave me a good interview as well. Was he, was he like part of the WWF? Was he part of like the crew that just came into film at the Spectrum or where did he come from? Cal Rudman? Yeah. He was part of the Spectrum. Right. Got you. It's part of that, part of that, that, uh, Whatever that network they had coming, because they had basketball, was it prison, hockey, <laughs> wrestling. I seem to remember there's like the prison network for one of the big territories. <laughs> Could, yeah, 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 I think that's it. Yeah, I think I think you're right. Right. Okay. So next question. Then we're going to go to modern day warrior. Uh, what really? Uh, right. This is a big one that I've never asked you, and I'd really love to know the answer. Uh, what really happened in Europe that got you fired from the WWF? Was there an incident? Right. I, forget about the rest of the question. What really happened? Oh God, Nick Buckle hated me. And for good reason. <laughs> I uh and I didn't discover that till later. I used to hang with his uh his his younger half brother, Dennis. And I smoked pot. This is way back in the early 80s, very you know, when you know uh well, we don't smoke marijuana with Skokie and everything, you know, it was it was long, long, long ago. And uh, his brother was pothead, but his brother was a stone cold junkie as well. And as I learned, I had family members that uh, were involved in an addiction, you know, out of control over their heads. Anybody that they knew, anybody that ever, if you ever may, may ever have a, a relative or, or someone close to you, you know, that, that's, that's a deeply, deeply rooted into a, you know, a physically, mentally dis destructive addiction. Everybody you see with them, anybody, anybody that's close to them, anybody that they even talk to, you hate. You just, you just, you're just, just guilty by association. So my so all the people that I saw that were, that were, they were talking to them or friends with them or knew him or just said hello to him. I hated them. So that I was pretty much, and I was, there was only two, the Dennis Bockle, Dennis Stamp and myself. And we we're the same, we we're the Greg Ganyan and Brunzel and a couple of, they came by later, but they were, they lived in the area and they were, you know, they, they're pretty much on their own and they were congenial guys. Nice guy, Patera, Ric Flair after a while. But, but these are the, you know, the early times when, when I was, so I was around Dennis and the two Dennis's, Stamp and Bockle, had the ring truck. So all these other guys, Bockwinkle, Larry Henning, all the baby Robinsons, they all had families and kids and everything else. And I was, you know, I was 20 years old. I didn't, I didn't know, you know, my hand from a handbag. You know, I didn't, I, you know, I, I didn't know. Nothing. So I'd go out on the road and I'd get, you know, to a town or something. Where, where, where I'd 
you'd have Stamp and Bachman, you know, the, the two guys, they're <laughs> college age, you know, university age, 20s and early 20s. So I, I'd hang with those guys, you know, rather than not all, well, not all the time, but, you know, rather than the big hotels or the us big stars were at, you know, I, you know, be with the, with the jabronis with the ring, you know, which, which you know, it was cool. But I, by, by being his, his friend and, and, and being, uh, being, being acquaintances with, with Dennis, uh, got Nick to hate me and Nick, you know, which was reason. And I, as I reasoned it late years, years after, which was surprising because he and Lord Blair's were such close friends. And he spent so much time in Hawaii and I knew him before I started wrestling. And I knew him from down at uh, Neo street, uh, uh, home where the Blair's has had, you know, everybody had always been cool and nice. And, you know, Nick was, was, uh, you know, but he went by the time, so he got to uh, Minnesota, got the championship belt, had his run. I'd you know, been in and out, and I couldn't take Minnesota, and I left. Then I, I went to uh, Florida, traveled around, and finally ended up in New York, WWE, WWF. And we had our, our – and word has it that he came to tally that they didn't want to fire me. They didn't, they didn't want to let me go because I – been too much to the organization, too much to the company. So they wanted to bring somebody in that was like a neutral, neutral party to them to, you know, to cause my, uh, my termination, <laughs> to cause my departure. So we went to Europe and, uh, you know, it was just, he, he was on me and on me and on me. And finally down one, you know, and I just snapped one time. I, you know, don't, you know, you want to get up, get up, you know, you know go for the belt here, which was, you know, Vince called me. He said, can't treat my agents like that. I said, yeah, Vince, you're right. Then I, I was pretty well burned out by then. I, you know, I'd had my run on the road and had my run there. and I needed to get back to Hawaii like I did. And it had been a while. So they, uh, I said, okay. And that was it. I said, thanks. I thanked Vince. thanked everybody. And then it was, you know, several years later, you know, it was Tally Hole and I was talking to Lord Blair's, and he says, yeah, Nick, uh, is he and Nick still corresponded? He says, yeah, it seems to think that, that they brought him in just to, uh, you know, purposely to, because he came in after he dropped the title, and he came in as an agent on the road. And they used to call him Captain Peckercheck, because he'd stand <laughs> over there, and, he, and, he'd, and, he, and he'd watch you when you're taking, because they, they uh, started the urine test. Hmm. And uh, they gave us, they started the, uh, for the cocaine and stuff. So, and he'd, you know, he'd get right down in there. You know, and, uh, <laughs> so he got the name Cap Pecker Checker. And then, and, and later on, and he would just, you know, he was just riding me and I didn't need to be right. Ridden, and I was a, I was a buck, still a bucking bronc on those days. <laughs> and that was, that was, that was pretty much it. You know, I, you know, I offered him the room, you know, if it, you know, and you know, which would have, would have been stupid then too. But you know, it was just it was being in, uh, being uh, being subjugated to dynamite and <laughs> Davy Boy and those guys for a whole week took me uh, to took me to another place. Hmm. Were they you know, needling was, you as well? So you you can't let them talk you like talk to you like this. Were they basically winding you up as well? I don't know if they're winding me up, but they're sure they're sure loosening me up. <laughs> Do you know, on the same European tour, I don't know if I'm speaking completely out of school here, but is it the same one that Junkyard Dog got laid off for as well? And maybe Coco Beware for a brief time? Um, no, was, I don't think so. I, I was on a tour later in Australia with the dog, but I don't remember him on that, that trip. That was, that was for WWE, WWF. Um... Italy and France, we went to, and um, I don't remember if the dog was there or not. To tell you the truth, I'll tell you what. We'll skip on Bulldog, that one. Then. Myself, Valentine, Beefcake. We'll, we'll leave. Yeah. We'll leave that one then. Um, yeah. We'll go to the next one then. So Neil Koska, uh, was there any interest from the NWA slash WCW when your WWF run ended? You ended up going to Stampede with the Bulldogs. 
any particular reason. Thanks for the great memories and great podcast as well. Thanks. <laughs> Hello. Well, Dynamite was booking uh, up for Calgary. He went in there for, uh, I don't know if the Stu was running the territory, but you know, Stu had always had his hands on but one of the boys. It's probably uh, Bruce, wasn't it, at that time, I think. Yeah, Bruce, I think, was running the territory then. So they brought Dynamite in for the book, and they wanted to put the belt. Uh, so I didn't really work Calgary as, as it was. I They brought uh, uh, Mock and Singh. Mock, Mock, Mock and Singh, uh, the big guy, he was the champion. And I, I didn't know him before that, but he, he, they brought me in to take the belt off of him and to put it on Davy Boy a couple of shows later. So I, I took it. Uh, you know, that's what he did. I went. I made. I made a couple loops uh, to Regina and a couple of places when I was up there. But I didn't really work the territory. I go in for like a week, stay at the Davy's uh, Davy Smith's house. So he had like two mansions into one. Just enormous houses they have up there in Calgary. I'd stay with Davey and, and travel around and then uh, leave the week, you know. Hmm. So uh, were you never interested in going to WCW then at that point? Were you just more or less done with the business? I had lost a step coming out of there. Even even after I left, the, you know, even before I went to Europe on the, the European tour, I'd, uh, before that, I massively tore my right groin. Uh, earlier, well, maybe a year or so, less than a year before that. And then if you know about Greg, you tear one, it's inevitable sooner or later the other one's going to go. After the after the, the the one heals, the other one's going to go, if not big, at least to a little point. So the other one, I, I lost a step, half a step, in my opinion. I wasn't moving the way I wanted to move. I had... Um, WCW just seemed like a real snake pit, like a real, like a real rat's nest, you know, and everybody, everybody going for, you know, all these guys that I'd come up against and been, you know, been, uh, I'd seen in action before wheeling their, you know, snaking their way through offices, and promotions and stuff. I didn't, uh, I have New Zealand. I did a little, a little promotion thing going in New Zealand and some other stuff with Japan and, Australian stuff. So I, you know, I wasn't, I think I was pretty much over, over the road and looking for a job back here in Hawaii, hmm. Where which was lucky to find. I found the came a longshoreman, hmm. which was a great, great move on my part. Uh, Joe, Fr oh God, I didn't even try and pronounce his name. Joe Freiheit, let's presume it's said like that. Uh, why was your stay in Mid-Atlantic Wrestling back in 82, I believe, so short? Because I went right back to WWF. Um, that, that's the one with the tag team with Wahoo and all that other stuff. I, I, I came in to... Uh, okay, they told me one story and something else happened. And uh, my wife was pregnant. It just, you know, it was, a, it was kind of a, you know, it was an unsettling time. Moving to Charlotte, I had been settled in New York and trying to get settled in Charlotte, but that, that territory is so, so, uh, was so far, so busy. It was just a giant area. Uh, next question then. Progressive Discussions asks, when you had that match with Lou Albano, uh, sorry, when Al uh, Lou Albano, if you thought my intro was bad, my question reading is awful. When Lou Albano was eating the meatball hero sandwich, was it really an accident that he stepped on it and slipped? Yeah. <laughs> was it? Yeah. Yeah, he was walking, you know, you know Lou, I used to walk around. And, and, uh, I, I told you the whole, I mentioned the whole psychology for me eating the sandwich in the ring because Lou and I were going into a series of tag matches with Snook and Buddy Rogers and stuff like that. So I wanted to try to convey, uh, you know, subliminally that I was just like Lou. I was going to eat sub, I was going to drink Coca-Colas and eat sub uh, meatball sandwiches and get as big and fat and sloppy as Lou could get, you know? So that was, you know, that was pretty much the impression we were But everything he must, he must have dropped the meatball and himself on the ground because he said, I, I, you know, I took a couple down. I obviously 
bought you know bought one or two from him and he was holding my drinks and stuff like that oh how, how i got to be how i got to be a legend in wwf <laughs> do you know no one asked this right but like one of the interviews that seems to be really doing the rounds at the moment someone tagged me on, on twitter or, or you or us uh the podcast on twitter was the one where you're eating donuts and spitting them all over mean gene like where did where did the food come from originally uh, where you start eating and wrestling at the same time? Somebody did, somebody made a dare. Did, did a, you got me on a dare for something? And uh, I think it started around Florida there. And, um, so I, and after I did it once, I, Jerry, Jerry Briscoe, he, he, was, he would uh, monitor the interviews. He'd make sure I didn't walk through with any food or he'd tackle me. <laughs> after that first one got through, they didn't want to... They didn't want that that eating on TV going by, so yeah, it was it was started started out there. And, yeah, it was usually a, uh, usually out of a dare, and then uh, that 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 meatball thing was just because of Lou, because you know because of the upcoming tag matches. It's like when we talked in the last last week or last hour, is that you know you you had the when you're doing the, the you know you're doing the the interviews, you had maybe this Saturday, your 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 wrestling the clean match and three Saturdays from that night or something, you're coming back in the death match or the cage match or whatever it was. So you're trying, you're trying to program in your mind how to lay out the interviews. You know, if you're going to, this one, you're going to go easy. I'm going to go easy this week and be really, be really serious about beating you and winning you and keeping the championship. And then really, and then two minutes later, I'm coming into the next interview screaming, yelling, you know, you, you really pissed me off. I'm really, you know, you've really done it now, you know. But, I mean, you know, you're in the same time, time period. All you did was change your shirt. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's the same, it's the same cycle, but you keep that, you know, the things you keep on your mind, you try to keep current, you try to keep fresh, you try to keep, uh, you know, ahead of, uh, or, or, you know, ahead of the people and make something in. Something entertaining for the people, entertaining for the fans. Something to catch dry. And you have to do, I, I bet you have to plan like 21 days worth of meals as well to prepare as well for 21 p- promos, which would be a, a bit of a nightmare, <laughs> I'm sure. 21 sandwiches. Right, we'll leave that one then and we'll go straight for, uh, straight from, oh, I've got my paper in the way, uh, from the far side, what would a typical MSG payoff be in 1981 and how did that compare to Boston or Baltimore or DC before Vince Jr. took over? Uh, sorry, uh, there's a new sentence. Uh, before Vince Jr. took over, is that your best year in wrestling monetary wise yeah of course yeah i had good years before but you don't have those you don't have those kind of markets anywhere else you know in boston philadelphia baltimore washington dc pittsburgh you know not to mention new york and you know uh all those other you know and you you, you know you're doing aside from california back then that was the original population Population belt through, and all the even the small towns over there are big towns. The Trentons and the, you know, every, all the envy the Hartford, the 20,000, 18, 20,000 seat building, New Haven, 15,000. Uh, and they fill them up, you know, weekly it's, without, you know, so, you know, to think that when somebody came in and they were the reason for business is, is you know, is really really stretching your ego because you came from Antonio Rocca to Bruno San Martino to Pedro to Backlund to Hulk to, you know, what Hulk did, the business, what Hulk did and what Vince did is they took it from a, a local, the local TV, your, your, your local marketing, which they had uh, predominantly around the Northwest, uh, Northeast portion Northeast corridor to the United States, and you went national. That's all. You went international in uh, Canada, and and then and then soon to follow Europe, Australia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so that's that that that's that was the difference, kind of. Thing. So with um, a payoff, uh, and maybe you don't want to give the numbers, of course. Uh, a payoff in mm. Madison Square Garden. What might that be on a typical main event compared to? Washington or Baltimore or another major market in the Northeast? They were all, all pretty much the same. We're all pretty much the same uh, 
ran the same sell out about 25 three grand you know for the main you gotta you gotta remember that the, the cards were loaded you know even if it was uh me and snooka in the cage there was uh back when somebody else for the world title and you had the world tag team champions and you probably had another secondary angle going. Hmm. So, you know, you had four or five matches, you know, in, in the garden alone as feature, you know, feature matches. So um, he was able to spread the, how he was able, that's how he was able to maintain the champion and everything like else, you know, maintain the drawing. They said back on wasn't drawing or back on, you know, that's, I don't have the figures and I don't, I don't have the numbers and to support me because I'm just saying, but, you, know, you, you don't have to have the figures if you got those kind of towns. And then, you know, to make sure that he's going to do business, he's going to give you a card. Patterson and Slaughter, uh, Patera, Patterson, Pedro Morales, and Morocco, something, you know, something else, you know, the, the tag team champions. And they got a, they, they, they got a feud going with uh, Can-Am, Martel and Tito or something like that, you know. So, the, you know, there's always, there's a handful of guys in there, Jake the Snake, with somebody else, with his wife, you know, Rick Root or something. You know, the, the cards are loaded, so you know, yeah. you, you you can't uh, extra a type of exclusivity as as far as payout. But the payoffs were all all good, and they would raise pretty much the same because all those towns were all all in the same, pretty much in the same neighborhood as capacity from eighteen to twenty one thousand, you know. So they, it wouldn't vary too much the amounts, and maybe the Boston card wouldn't be as as loaded as the garden card. So, you know, everything kind of evened out. Mm. Uh, right then. So it's the question that you've, uh, you've been waiting for. Um, and I've actually added this beforehand. So I'm going to read this verbatim as well. So it's a very rare criticism from, of all people, Jim Cornette, who admittedly mm. had barely seen anything you had done in your career, especially the WWF. Uh, so this question is from Jason Adair. Uh, I've always enjoyed hearing Jim Cornette tell different wrestling stories and opinions on old school wrestling. But one thing I didn't care for was him saying Don wasn't good with his promos, basically saying average. Uh, Jim's co-host disagreed with him. Uh, any thoughts on what he said? I mean, I guess everyone has their own opinions on stuff, but come on, that's some bull jive. I think he means bullshit. Mm, he maybe he came towards the end of my uh, end of my baby face and stuff. My end of my run, and he, he wasn't uh, he wasn't enamored with my work. When my my uh, could have been when I had the bad groins and stuff, you know. When I was moving slow, I wasn't, you know. Um, he didn't like me. <laughs> you know, he's. he's he seems to be pretty well uh, knowledgeable on, on most most of the things he does, but you know he's just repeating stories that are pretty much legendary. You know of uh, of you know haystacks getting shoe flyed on the airplane and, and you know different fights and stuff like that. And Davy Boy or uh, Dynamite and Rougeau and, and stuff like that. You know, so I don't. He wasn't there. I, the majority, probably ninety nine percent of the. Uh, of his comments or his, his uh, observations. I don't think he was actually actually present or part of. Hmm. Well, he, stuff he, around he, Tennessee. He, he, said, he said he's never seen your classic stuff in the WWF, like 81, 82, 83, and all that type of thing. So I don't even know why he sort of made comment on it, to be honest, because they, as far as I, because I obviously wasn't even born when you were, um, you know, uh, wrestling full time and everything, uh, apart from, you know, the last few years. And, um, yeah, I've gone back. I mean, even in the intro of this show, I've clipped quite a few of your promos at the beginning, and they're brilliant. Like, anyone can see that. Well, uh, just in his defense, maybe he was just with those Southern guys, you know, and had that Southern attitude. I, I don't know, because he came from Tennessee, and probably somewhere along the line, he, you know, he did business or became friendly with somebody that, that's not uh, – that, that didn't get along with me and, you know, it wasn't a close friend of mine. Like the Rougeaus. I thought, you know, I never thought I had heat with the Rougeaus, but then I saw um, in the Dynamite show, they were talking about Dino Bravo and how Dino Bravo was a stooge for the Bulldogs and would run back and tell them everything they said. And they fed this to the to, to Dino and that. Well, hell, if they did that to Dino, they didn't like Dino and they thought that much of Dino. And Dino and I were, 
you know, we butted along. We we trained we trained together and, and traveled a lot together. Well, if they thought that much of Dino, then they had to hate me. You know, because I, mean? I I didn't even speak French. I didn't even speak French Canadian. I, I wasn't. You know, they were from the same place. They were all brothers from the same uh, from the same town. So if they thought they thought Dino was a stooge, I, you know, God knows what they thought of me. So you know, <laughs> he probably was just you know involved with somebody you know or just didn't like me. It's it's I, unbelievable as it may seem. Some people may not care for my particular type of genius but, you, know. <laughs> you know i rarely give my opinion to or maybe i do and i don't notice it but jim you're wrong clearly you're wrong anyone can see that stevie wonder can see that you're wrong um another question this is actually from me is um in the same clip actually with jim Cornette, where he's discussing the promos he's also asked how come you were never considered uh, to be world champion uh, when was the closest you maybe got to world champion and um, let's say the NWA world championship? Were you ever considered for that? And maybe why were you passed over? Do you think? Oh, when Barnett, when Barnett was, was running Georgia and there, there was a, there was a thought there, but I, I was never, I could never last. I was, I was no, I was definitely no flair. I would never, you know, be getting, getting on an airplane and Christmas day to fly. It was too much. I had to get back. I guess I had to balance my life. I was lucky. I experienced, you know, all those highs, Madison Square Garden and the WrestleManias and the, the Fuji Vices and all those, you know, the Oprah Winfrey's. I, I was able to experience all those things. But to keep a, my, I keep a balance to my life, I was I was a full-time, when I wasn't there, when I was, was home, I was a full-time surfer. I was, you know, I was really, you know, I, and I wasn't bad. I was, you know, I was no Kelly Slater, that's for damn sure. But, you know, I was, you know, I was, you know, I was, you know, I was, I was known in all the all the big spots, all the all the familiar spots all over this island and, and all over the state, and, and you know people knew me not only from wrestling but previously from before surfing. So I was able to use surfing a little bit of balance as, as far as not going off way too deep. And, and on the other hand, it, it gave me an intense hatred for people places places like Minnesota. And you know, living in that type of you know, Canada, or, you know, living away from the ocean, and 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 places like that. So, you know, it would where it uh, where it help where it help give me life and renew me, and strengthen me, and, and take away a lot of uh, hurts and, and ills and boo boos and stuff that I got. It also it it it, it drew me, pulled me back, as well as not being able to. The Briscoes were from Oklahoma. They came, you know, they lived in, you know, uh, they grew up near, you know, Indian reservations and Indian in, Indian living and stuff. So they got to Florida. They bought, they were happy. You know, it was, it was great for them. People thought I had money. I didn't have money. I, you know, you, you give Hawaiian, you give Hawaiian a bag of poi, a bowl and a can of salmon, and he's rich. And, and of course, you have to have your quiver of surfboards for the year. You have your small wave board, your medium-sized board, and your big wave board. So, you know, you got you need three boards, you know, your bag of poi, your can of salmon, and you're pretty much, you are rich at that point. You know, so it wasn't, uh, when I was able to come back here and take a couple months off, three, four months off from my humdrum on the road to get away and to come out here and surf these beautiful waves, Sunset Beach, and Olive and Pipeline and stuff, you know, and, and you know, and, and really to know, to really sit there, no fear <laughs> and no death when you're caught inside, you know, and, 10, 12, 15 foot wave is breaking out in front of you and you, you got no place to go but down. You're just going, oh, I'll never do this again. I'll never get in this position again. And you get your board, you're right back out there. Same thing, <laughs> same, same position, same thing, same tears running down your, same chills running up your spine and tears running down your side of your face. I'll never do this again. But you make it out and you go back, you make it through and you go again. So you're telling me that um, at the beginning of uh, of the question, you said that Jim Barnett, uh, there was a thought of making you world champion at one time. Was, did it have anything to do with you uh, topless on horseback and a photo? And he made that decision. Oh yeah, that's a. Uh, oh that's my, one of the boy. Low in my One of the low, one of the low points of my life. <laughs> But was it was it seriously uh, was it seriously brought up uh, that <laughs> y your name was brought up in meetings and stuff? And were you like, how far along? Oh God, I, been? I have no idea. I have no. I just said that this, uh, but 
I was called called back in the Omni one night, and uh, the Gypsy was back there with his bottle of cognac. He says, oh, my boy, would you care for a sip of cognac? It's very expensive. I said, oh, no, thanks, you know. Thank you, Jim. No, you know, so. Andre was there. I just brought a bottle. So I got a bottle for him. and brought it into the locker room. Maybe that's why he got a, he, he got, somebody must have stooged to him. You know, I said, you know, so I said, no. So I said, oh, huh. remember that per picture you took up at Curtis's ranch where you with no shirt and had with the holding, holding the horses? I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> You don't happen to have any of those. I didn't even know where that one was. <laughs> but as I shrunk down into, you know, as I shriveled down smaller than Tom Thumb and just, uh, you know, hid in my own tears, drowned in one of my own tears. It was, you know, a couple was, of photos and you could have been world champion. Who knows? But, yeah, who knows? <laughs> well, we'll, uh, we'll skip out on that yeah, one. And Christmas we'll, off. <laughs> Christmas off. Christmas off in Hawaii surfing. Uh, we'll go to the next. Chris Alex asks, uh, memories of working as the masked Aki Oni in uh, the war Japanese promotion in 1994. And uh, have yeah. you got enough time off to uh, do an entire Japanese tour from uh, Longshoreman? I was, uh, yeah, I was sick leave, you know. They weren't long tours. They were, you know, they were like week tours. They were for, for Tenru. I was, uh, I was friends, good friends with Tenru. Used to take him out in Florida, take him around, and met him, and he used to come to Hawaii, and um, I'd hook him up here. He was a good, so he he started his own company, and um, I it must have been with Baba, something to do with Baba or something, or or Noki. I don't know why they didn't want to use me as Mara, as myself, because they put me in a put me in a, a in a mask and. In a red outfit, which Akioni means a red death. I think that's A-K-E is, is A-K-A, but I think it's A-K-E is the spelling of it. And Oni is, so it's a red death. And they wanted me to go and throwing stuff through the crowd, blowing powder or something in the crowd. And they thought, oh, that, that, oh, you get so much heat. I get so much heat doing that. But I, you know, I, I don't know what that was. But. That was, a, yeah, it was a short time. It was, I hated working with a mask. Was, in fact, they came to the Wida, the Japanese guy with Jeet Singer. They used to use fire. The, by that time, Japan, they were using fire extinguishers in their finish. And the fire extinguishers over there, they come, I don't know about, they come and they take all the oxygen out of the air where you can't breathe. And, you know, you're going 20, 30 minutes in a match. Somebody comes and shoots a fire extinguisher in the ring and there's no oxygen. I was, you know, I went I was pulling my mask up and stuff anyway, trying to be exposed. But that, was, yeah, that was that was a trip, and having to clean all those clothes every night. Was yeah. it? Um, I mean, war was probably. I mean, I don't know my Japanese wrestling at all, but it wasn't the first or second top promotion. I mean, how how were the payoffs? Oh for no, a short there were tour? many. There were lots of promotions by then. Yeah, all kinds. Um, what what was a what was the payment for a, for a tour for war? I, no specific number if you don't want to give it, but two, three thousand a week. Mm -hmm. It was pretty, you know, probably two, three more. Just one week, probably three grand a tour, hotel and transportation. And the the I think I went two or three times for them. And the last time I, they put me up in Tokyo by the near the um, the Tokyo uh, Tokyo Tower and stuff by the by the yeah Rapongi. by the uh, yeah, well, yeah, by point, but uh, was only by uh, Akasa uh, Azebu. I was only walking 15, 25 minutes walk to Clark Hatch, uh, Clark Hatch Gym and Azebu Towers and stuff there. So I was, you know, that I'd walk and work out and had that whole thing, you know. So I, a couple of days, whole days I was off in Tokyo, nothing to do, but eat, <laughs> drink. And work on breathing in a mask and uh, throw yeah. powder into the crowd. Yeah. <laughs> All right. uh, next question then from Jeremiah C H or Jeremiah. Uh, what was the difference in the main event payoff wrestling Hogan and Backland in Madison Square Garden? I don't think there was much. Probably about this. I don't know. It was... 
<laughs> if you hit Hogan right, you, you, you catch Hogan. I caught him on a, those uh, Saturday Night Live things. And the, uh, uh, um, NBC would kick in an extra payoff. So you're actually getting two for one. So it'd be a double, uh, be like the garden payoff, you know, top money in the garden, 25, three grand. And the NBC or the TV place would usually match, usually match that. So it was, a, it was a good deal if you had to catch that. I caught it with Brody and I caught it a couple other places. Not, uh, yeah, Bundy, sorry, not Brody. Bundy, WrestleMania 2, and a couple other times I got the, you know, main event on Saturday night main event. Right, uh, next one is Steve Ag... Oh, it's another surname I can't pronounce. Aguar. Agur. Uh, hey, Don, I was wondering how your WCW Slamboree Legends reunion was, and if you met any legends for the first time. Hmm... It was good. Uh, um, that was the one I went for uh, Turner, right? Wahoo yeah, I think it was, was it like 93 or something around that? Yeah, probably around there later. Davey Boy. Davey Boy was wrestling Vader. I remember they had a hell of a match. I saw I just, I just saw guys at uh, Barry Windham had grown into well, one of the finest workers in the country, you know. And he was uh, he was he was with the champ that night. Uh Flair, I guess. So Barry, you know, I got to see. I, I didn't meet any new guys. I don't think. But most of the, you know, it's Stan Hansen and you know all those guys I knew before. KW Music asks: uh, The Roddy Piper face turn in Georgia was legendary, with Piper saving Gold Gordon solely from your attack. After being such a big part of a major angle, why were you gone from the territory so quickly afterwards? William Banks asked the same question. That was the burnout, uh, Ber Ole Anderson, and the confusion of the whole uh, NWA told one thing, something else happening, and oh god, what was it? Uh, first child, second child, first kid. Yeah, my wife was get having a baby. My daughter was being born. Yeah, I didn't stay. I was just, uh, yeah, I just had it. I went. I called. Uh, I called back. Called Vince when I was there. Asked him to take over. Just be responsible for my booking. Go home. Mm. That's all right. So, uh, I mean, what were you told to originally? Uh, we we you sort of promised a certain amount of main events, maybe, and then Oli took it away. I was going to come. I was going to come in and partner up with Wahoo, uh, the tag team. We're going to get the. Uh, that world tag team uh, title, tight, you know, world tag team title straps, and then I was gonna, and I was gonna double and work around a little while with that, because Carolina had it was a big, you know, that that area, Carolina, Georgia, uh, even into Florida with those straps, it, it was big, uh, big tag team area, you, you know, big tag team matches, and then I was gonna turn on Wahoo, and then go along there. As it went, it turned into where I turned on Piper and, and Jack Briscoe was in there. I, I turned on Jack Briscoe. So it, it worked out all right. It worked, you know, business-wise. I just, uh, you know, after that long run in New York and you know, all unsettling, you know, you just, you know, not that I, you do a lot of things that are wrong. You know, you make a lot of wrong decisions at the time just to, you um, just to preserve your, my own mental state, my peace of mind, you know, and just not to, not to get run over by the machine, you know, be trampled by uh, what's coming down and just, just break off and, and pull away. Hmm. Uh, we'll ask a couple more then. Uh, Dave Experience asks, any stories or memories of working specifically at the Maple Leaf Gardens? No. <laughs> It, uh, a lot of good matches there, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, a lot of backlands and uh, snookers and Piper and, you know, just they, they had a lot of, a lot of, it followed out of the New York TV, but then a lot of things were crossed too. You, you uh, Mosca and uh, guys who were working from, from Carolinas and NWA were working with some of those guys at times and, so it was it was a good uh, it was a good change of 
See, in the WWF, you got into it. When you got into a promo, every night, every night, every night, you're with, with the same guy. Same. And, and the, not a case of being lazy or, or just being bored or whatever it is. You get into the same matches, routine, routine. You know, it, it's working. Work, worked in worked in Baltimore. It'll work in, in it'll work in Pittsburgh. You know, and you get you just go and these other things. And you're moving. You know, you're not having to create. When before it went to that, you'd, you'd have to go out every night. You wouldn't have to, but if if you're you know if you're progressing, if you're in the business to to, to get by and to, to get ahead, you'd go ahead every night. And you come up with stuff new. You come up with new new stuff. Come up with new you know new ways to do things or new ideas or different timing, different timing at least or you know just different ideas, different thought process. After a while, with that, every while you need two, three, four months with the same guy, same man. You know, and we would progress. Maybe go to a lumberjack or go to a death match or go to a cage match or something like that. But you know, it would still be the same. You know, wrestling the same guy every night. Every, and very rarely did that, that, which really, which really, I think, hurt a lot of the quality, a lot of the matches. You know, at least for myself, I think it did. Oh. Maybe that's what. Uh, maybe those are the ones. What's his name? The 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 manager uh, Jim Cornette saw. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he saw any WWF to be perfectly honest. He was, he was uh, too busy with the Southern States. Uh, the next one, uh, I'm not booked. Terry asks, do you have any memories of King Kong Bruiser Brody? Also, did you see the episode of Dark Side of the Ring on him? And if so, what did you think? Never met Brody. Never, really? never met King Kong Brody. Never. He came. I came after him, or he came after me. I know. He got his start in Australia with uh, King Curtis, Curtis Alkea and Mark Lewin. He went there, uh, Frank Goodish, and Abdullah was their heel. I think by, by the time Curtis was already a baby face, Abdullah was their heel. And Curtis uh, Curtis took Brew Brody to be uh, Abdullah's uh, partner in crime over there. So he got that, then he got him to Japan, and that's where – they got that that's that you know all over the arena style because Curtis King Curtis Curtis yeah, okay, King Curtis he was the one that started all that. He went to Japan first with Ricky Dozan and, and Tally Ho was booking out of there and he was he was one of the guys that, that went to Japan and he did that you know one side of the building the all other side of the building the chairs and the turnbuckles and everything else. So he was one of that and he he kind of willed it on to Abdullah, Abdullah to Brody, and those guys. You know, they 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 took followed the suit to that. Stan Hansen, those guys that, that followed in that that vein, of taking wrestling in all Terry Funk, all over the place. I'll tell you what, we're going to ask one more, and uh, it's one that I've saved because I'm really interested in this because I remember seeing this when I was very young. Uh, when Don did the music video for Land of a Thousand Dances, did he get a nice payoff? Uh, King Kong Bundy claimed they got nothing for doing those music videos in the 80s. Thank you. Uh, that was by Joe right. Zapta, by the way. Or Zapata. I think he's right. I don't think we did. I don't think we did get... Uh, we had we were, we were there the day before, and they, they set up everything for the name. I mean, that's one of the hardest days I've ever worked in my life <laughs> uh, as well. I, 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 that, to sit there and go... Go over that song. Oh God, it had to be a hundred times. You did this section, then you're shooting that section, then you're shooting these guys, and you're going back and forth. Then you're shooting your your part, and then every other everybody's everybody had their own verse and stuff. Uncle Elmer had that little the little suckling pig, and he was standing there with the, it was on the other side of the line for me. Thank you. But he had the, the pig, and they had him holding the pig, and cousin Junior and Hell Billy kept squeezing. I guess they, they know how to. They're all country boys that know how to squeeze the pig and poke the pig, so he's pissing all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> Just all over, all over and all over the back there. But yeah, that was the. As far as I know, I, as far as I know, I don't think we got paid. It may be residuals off the off the album or, or something, but, but I don't remember. Uh, I, I can't. I can't remember an actual check or payoff coming for that. But man, did we work hard, Jesus! And that was, you know, that, that, you know, that was. It, it, it was a, one of Vince's, it was Vince's baby. It was one of Vince's things, you know, 
The next year, he was practicing dance steps in Atlantic <laughs> City. But this, this was he was just there and over and oh, you know, and just his first, uh, his first venture into you know, into you know another another world. Yeah. Um. So, uh, uh, KW Music actually asked in that sort of vein uh, because, uh, like, the Goonies are good enough with um, Cindy Lauper. And things like that. did did like filming these videos sort of offend your sensibilities as an old school wrestler, or were we just like, yeah, let's do it. Yeah, just let's do. It. By that time, we're moving so fast. He had he had us moving so fast and so far and so often. I guess I don't remember doing a promo with with Oprah Winfrey. Oprah Winfrey, I don't, I, I you know you could have knocked me over with a, with a with a sneeze. I said that's Oprah Winfrey. I mean I. Uh, I'm with Oprah Winfrey there, you know. I, why am I not hitting on her? Why am I not, you know, why am I not, you know, telling her I'm going to take her to the moon or something, you know, and getting over on this promo? Why, I, you know, but, you know, you just, every, everything, things were moving so fast and changing, you know. So it wasn't the end of kayfabe yet, but it was still going to, I think the Sheik and, and the Duggan still hadn't gotten busted on the Garden State Parkway yet for riding, <laughs> riding together. But uh, things was moving so fast. I mean, with the Mr. Food, that was, you know, Mr. Fuji. I mean, uh, Fuji Vice and those things are taking place. These movies and this filming, filming down in Baltimore. They're, 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 we were filming on, on, we were filming on the move out in Hollywood. They're shooting me and Fuji walking to the, getting turned down by the guy at the gate. You know, get out of here. We're here for picture our movie. We're going to beat it, you know. And what, I mean, it, if things are moving so fast and so far, I, you don't really have time to question all that, you know. And with the with the, uh, they they flew me down to uh, Harrisburg one one afternoon to take uh, with a bunch in in the Harrisburg, which is the capital of of Pennsylvania, was as far as state's capital, and there were a bunch of uh, there were judges and lawyers and, and uh, judicial. I forget who they, are, but we were on the cover of of the old Life magazine. We're shooting, they're doing a bunch of shoots with wrestlers, all wrestlers, and this is early eight. All wrestling has, has gone uh, gone modern day, uh, you know, entered into the yuppie group because I was there. I was I was getting photographed with lawyers and judges and stuff in a courtroom. Obviously, auto, you know, court wasn't in session, but you know, doing stuff, grabbing the judge, and you know, the different clowning around like that, threatening the lawyer, and you know, you know it was just it, things were moving so fast. You just you, you, you know, you just had to accept them. Hmm. Otherwise, you'd be standing in the butt, sucking your thumb. Uh, do you know, I'll, I'll, just before we get to the Fuji story of the week, assuming we've got a Fuji story of the week. Um, oh, I don't know what to oh, okay. Uh, well, I'll ask you what, this one thing while you think of a Fuji story of the week as well. is. Do you remember one storyline or segment or something like that in wrestling uh, where you were thinking, oh, kayfabe-wise... There are this, but there's there's no putting the toothpaste back in the tube. There's no the cat's out of the bag on this one. We're never coming back from this one because that was so hokey. It's like a single segment or storyline, maybe. Um, that actually myself. Uh, no, any anything you saw that went oh. Oh, in my day, we kept everything was were pretty much tight, you know. Um, uh, flower shops and stuff were getting out there, but I, I don't think you know we we hadn't before I left. We hadn't com- completely gone. We hadn't. They hadn't got rid of the commission yet. They hadn't. You know. They hadn't. They hadn't gone uh, all the way entertainment yet. And it was still. We're still going, still going back in with Hollywood, with, with movie stars and stuff like that, and still had the association with that type of thing. But but it had the, the total die hadn't been cut, cast as far as that happening yet. So it was kind of like I say for us in in the in the middle of the thing, it was just moving so fast that we were just reacting to the you know what was on the paper. You know, it's like that those jokes I read for Fuji. I didn't. I don't remember. I don't know what I was talking about, and I had no idea what I was saying at the time. You know, and I don't to this day. I still don't remember. But it was just it was, things are moving so fast, and you know, you just you know, you just you know, you had to go in here. You had to do fittings from the doll. You had to go do this. And you had you know, they were flying. They were throwing me, throwing us on planes. 
we're in New Jersey and flying us to LA to do to drive around Los Angeles to get rejected by uh, by you know movie stuff producers and directors and stuff. But you know, just oh god, you know, you couldn't find a director out here in New Jersey. You know, <laughs> a guy playing a, a, a promoter, a, a movie director to tell me no here in New Jersey. He had to fly all, all the way to Los Angeles, all the way to Hollywood, to go to somebody else's house. Ah, you know. But that's the way it was. That's the way it's moving, man. You've got to keep it authentic, haven't you? I tell you what, we're going to end it with. Uh, do we have a, a Fuji story of the week, or should we just end it? Well, I'll think of next. I'm going to end it. I was I was thinking all week on that last one about the snow, and um, I had one, but I guess it slipped me now. I've kind of run through a lot of them already, so I don't I don't want to double up on, on too many of them. No, Fuji didn't like to double up on ribs, did he? No, no, no. The the, the locks and the ribs. And... <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, you know, I'm I'm uh, happy to shut the podcast down because as we're speaking, I think it's, is it 11 o'clock in the morning where you are and it's midnight where I am. So um, I'm happy to go to bed at this point because we've got 11 hours different. Or is it, is it one o'clock actually? Sorry, it's one o'clock where you are, isn't it? One o'clock. One, one o'clock. o'clock. So there you go. Um, right. So I will shut down the podcast. So thank you very much for listening once again. Twitter. Don Morocco Pod, YouTube, Don Morocco's Magnificent Podcast. Uh, I, the podcast is available wherever you get it. I never know if, if anyone's listening to the audio or the video only. There's some sort of weird crossover there. So anyway, and then also there's DonTheRockMorocco.com where you can get your signed photos, figures, cards, and maybe more. I, is there more? <laughs> or is it only those three? I don't know. Oh, all right, fair enough then. Well, whatever there is, there's stuff that you can buy signed by Don himself. But for me, James, thank you very much for listening. We'll catch you next week. And thank you, Don, for being with us once again. Mahalo and hello, everybody. Nice one. See you next week. Cheers. Mm-hmm.